Thank you. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be visiting back uh, Haldor Topso, we, we collaborated on and off for probably close to 15 years now. I, and uh, we did quite a few projects in years past, uh, working with uh, Niels Dalskov and Nina Jokil and, uh, and a few other people from, from here. And uh, it, I'm, I'm glad to be back in Denmark. Um, so I have a little bit of a difficult job, right? Because uh, number one, I have to wake you up after lunch. And in spite of the warm temperature, I have to convince you not to go into a nap. If you go into a nap anyway, I won't be offended. I'll understand that it's, uh, it's the constraints, right? But I'll try to, I'll do my best to keep you awake. Um, so I have a lot to tell you. Um, we have been working on continuous manufacturing for a long time already, in my group in particular for over 15 years. And um, continuous manufacturing is not new, right? It's not a new idea. In fact, it's been practiced in other industries for over 100 years. Um, but in the main industry that I work on, pharmaceuticals, uh, it is a, something that they haven't done. So about 15 years ago, we started trying to convince them that you could do continuous manufacturing for powder processes. And it took a while, but in the last seven or eight years, this has become a major initiative within the pharmaceutical industry worldwide. There are dozens of companies actively pursuing it. Regulators from all over the world have endorsed the approach. So we've been very busy. And also, we've been very lucky because we have been able to actually do what I'm going to tell you about several times, which is to look into how to implement a completely integrated process um, in a number of practical occasions to the point where there are now commercial processes that are operating, that, are, uh, that were implemented based on some of the work that I'm going to tell you. So um, that's what the angle I'm coming from. Um, so let's start by defining what advanced manufacturing is. It's like one of those words, as in a previous talk, somebody said everybody uses this word, but nobody knows really what it means. So uh, advanced manufacturing has been defined based on its attributes. And you know, I, I could tell you where this came from, but I, I don't think it matters too much. It's basically um, relates to processes that you can design predictably in the computer, digital design, yeah? where there is automation, where there is an artificial intelligence in place that basically determines how to run the process, where it has been optimized, meaning that Somebody has taken the time to figure out how to make the best product at the best price under the best conditions. Scalable, where we know how to go up and down in size or in volume and where it's transferable and portable. And these are attributes uh, that are recognized as describing what an advanced manufacturing process is. I added one word there, which is achievable. So we know about continuous processing in petroleum, but in powders, not so much. So I'm here to tell you how we make it happen. So there are a number of advantages to continuous manufacturing. And I think a number of people in the room are familiar with this because you practice continuous manufacturing. Um, some of the advantages are that you can develop your process in the same equipment that you're going to make your product. So you don't need to go through process scale up. In many cases, the footprint of a continuous process is much smaller than the equivalent batch process that will produce the same amount of product. You can, get, you can implement real-time quality assurance with close to 100% product compliance. You could, in theory, eliminate essentially all the waste uh, because you're monitoring your process in real time. So in theory, at least, you know when you're going to have a failure and you can avoid it. It's well known that this is much less expensive than batch. There is a lot of savings. In labor, among other things, it's not the only place where you save money, but it's one place where you save a lot of money. One reason why pharma is so interested in this is because you can develop your product and your process much faster. And the reason is that a continuous process responds to changes in settings in about minutes. So you can run an entire design of experiments with 30 or 40 conditions in a day or two. Of course, you have to have the right data captures in place. You have to know how to process the data. But you can really develop products and processes much, much quicker. And we have done that. And it's not a theory. You really can do that. The processes are more robust and more reliable. And because the increase in production is based on how long you run your process, 
you can make a larger lot or a smaller lot depending on the SKU that you're trying to fill or you could um, run it for longer or, or less depending on the market conditions. So you're not stuck with a fixed amount you're going to make because you're going to run a batch process with a fixed size blender. So, so these are some reasons why this is desirable and um, some of these reasons have been deciding factors in other industries to go this way. Now, continuous processes to really run the way they're meant to, they need to have in place closed loop controls. Without a closed loop control, your continuous process will not be running under optimum conditions. So just to quickly define a continuous process, I'm showing in this picture three gravimetric feeders. API means active pharmaceutical ingredient. This is a slide from my pharma presentation. So there is one ingredient and another ingredient, and we're feeding them through a mill so that we can continuously de-lump or de-agglomerate materials. And then there is another ingredient that comes after the mill. We typically do this when the material is shear sensitive and we don't want to damage it. And then we go through a continuous blender and the powder comes out as a homogeneous mixture that then goes into a tablet press where it comes out as a compressed product. Now, there are process analytical technology methods that, and I'll talk a lot more about this, so I'll give you more details later, but basically there are instruments that are monitoring the properties of the material at different stages, and that is combined with an understanding of the effect of process parameters to, I don't know what's going on here, okay, sorry about that, okay, to then feed onto a process controller. And I don't know whether everybody in the room is an engineer and whether even those that are engineers remember process control from college, but basically the readings from the analytical tools together with the readings from the instrumentation are fed to the process controller, which is basically a computer where we have a model of the process and that model is able to describe the effect of different inputs on outputs. So that if we detect, let's say, that the product is not quite what we want it to be, maybe the tablets are not as hard as we want them to be, maybe they're a little underweight, or maybe the composition is a little off, the controller knows which actions to take, and it feeds those control actions back to actuators that then correct so that the process quickly goes back to the desired state, okay? In a nutshell, that's how a continuous process is supposed to work. Now, how do we develop these systems? So, we have articulated a pathway to do this, and when a company comes to us, if it's a pharmaceutical product, typically we're very familiar already with the materials and the process, it takes us in the order of maybe six months to deliver back to them the complete specification of a continuous process. The first time we did it, it took us about three years. So obviously there is accumulation of knowledge that assists you in gaining speed. So our general approach is we'll first characterize the materials. We will measure a number of attributes that we know already are important to continuous manufacturing. And then we will adapt our existing models for every process component for the new materials that we just received. So we already have many models of many process components, but you give us a new material and typically we have to tweak the model a little bit so that it represents what that new material is gonna do. And then these models of the different components are all brought together into an integrated dynamic model of the entire line. So we build integrated models that are able to predict what's going to happen in the system as perturbations come in or as you change settings. And we started building these integrated models close to 10 years ago. So we had 10 years of experience building up the capability to do this. We use the integrated models then to explore the parametric space, to refine the design, to consider alternative equipment, or to examine what would happen if one of the materials were to behave differently. Etc., so that we then produce a series of specifications that can then be implemented in the physical line that we already built at Rutgers. We, in fact, have built more than one, or at the customer, right? Um, in pharma, the equipment being used for continuous processing is actually rather similar from company to company. So typically, we're able to create a process that is very much like the one that eventually our partner is going to build. And then that information goes to the partners so that they can assemble their line. And there is some translation of models and uh, some retesting of equipment to make sure that their system is operating under optimum conditions. Let's talk about specifically the steps that you have to follow. And I'm going to quickly walk you through the 12 steps that constitute our approach for overcoming your addiction to batch processes. 
And then we're going to go step by step on how do you make it happen, right? How do you make it work? And uh, Nina suggested that maybe I wanted to customize the presentation to sort of like share with you how would it be like for Haldor to do this, yeah? So I'm going to try to do that. So first step is the rough conceptual design. One of the previous speakers said something I completely agree with. You need to start with a plan. You need to slow down, sit down, and come up with a really good plan for implementing advanced manufacturing technology. It's very easy, otherwise, to go the wrong direction. It's very important to do this. Then characterize the materials, right? After you've selected which product you want to manufacture via continuous integrated systems, we need to understand the powders. We need to understand what the powders do so that then we can specify the proper equipment, which is the next set of steps. We specify the unit operations, we characterize their performance, and we develop the unit operation model, yeah? the model that describes each piece of equipment. Then that information is brought into the integrated model that describes the line as a whole, and we look at the open loop performance. This is the performance of the integrated line before supervisory control is implemented. And I'll explain later why that's important. It's really critical. After that, you put in place your sensing methodologies, right? Only after you understand how your system operates in open loop, you know which variables are critical, then you know what you need to measure. And that's when you define your sensors and the different data streams that you're going to use. And you implement also those sensing methodologies in the model. We have the ability to incorporate into the model the action of the different sensing systems. So with that, we build the open loop integrated flow ship, and I call that olive, and try to remember that, we'll save a time later. And then the next three steps go into implementing the supervisory control system. So now we design the control architecture, we select proper controller parameters, and then we characterize how well is the system working in closed loop. So now there is a central control system that I'll describe in more detail later that is able to manipulate whichever levers are necessary to get the system to run as close to optimum as possible. Yes? And this closed loop integrated flow ship, we'll call it CLIF to, this, to this basically differentiate from the open loop system. Yeah? The last step is now that we have a supervisory control architecture, we can optimize. All right. So I'm going to walk you through these steps now one at a time and try to share with you what kind of work goes into making this happen. So as um, you know, most of our work in this area has been in pharmaceuticals. We've been developing continuous pharmaceutical manufacturing systems for quite a few years. And so basically we articulated all the necessary activities into five laboratories which work very closely together. So in my group there are five areas with different people responsible for them to examine material properties, to do all the process modeling, to do all of the sensors and data analytics, to do process control, and to do process integration. And several pharma companies that we work closely with, like JSK and Johnson and & Johnson and Pfizer, have actually created very similar internal structures because this is just logic. This is how the work breaks down. Now, once you have this in place, we have found it's actually rather easy to move on to other areas like catalysts or food products or cosmetics or batteries, etc. We actually have active projects in most of these areas now to support the implementation of continuous systems in all those areas. What's very, very interesting is that even though the products are very different, a powder is a powder. And what you learn to design feeders or blenders or mills or granulators in pharma applies very well to several other areas. We've been able to really translate a lot of our language to other areas. And I think some of the previous speakers would agree with me because I detected in some of their presentations a lot of the pharma language. So I know for sure that some of those tools are being applied to pharma customers. Um, now, out of the five laboratories come outcomes. And so those outcomes include libraries of material properties, libraries of models, methodologies to achieve real-time quality assurance, methodologies to implement process control, algorithms to integrate the system. So, this, on the left, we call the Advanced Manufacturing Toolbox. These are tools. These are things you can apply, yes? And so it's interesting to think about what the, do each of these pieces um, of this chart uh, actually give you, right? So the platforms, the verticals, give you systems. 
manufacturing systems that have been demonstrated, that have been shown to work, that we know how to implement. The horizontal bars on the right are basically where your, your process science resides. That's where you basically have your basic knowledge about how to develop a process. While out of the toolbox, obviously, you have tools for implementation. And these components are basically also training tools. They're knowledge repositories. They're also experiential opportunities for people to learn how to do the work. So we interface with industry a lot, and it's very common for us to have people from companies that are doing projects with us to basically come and spend time in our lab. Sometimes it's one day, sometimes it's one year. And I'll, right now, I'll issue an invitation. If Haldor Tops is really interested in using what we're doing, the lab has an open door, and we will be very happy to welcome people from the company to come and spend as much time with us as they feel is necessary so that they can really gain a quick, uh, you know, quick access to the know-how. It's mostly know-how. Okay? So moving on, how do we make this happen? And I took, I hope it's okay, I took the liberty to try to put myself in your shoes and think about what would I do if I were working for Haldor, how would I go ahead and do this, right? So the first thing is really the plan. It's very, very, very important. I have seen companies fail because they didn't take the time to think which is the right product to start with, what do we want the platform to be able to do? Do we want to build a dedicated platform for just one product, or do we want to build a more expensive but more powerful, flexible platform that can be quickly adapted to uh, other products? Um, if so, which is the right platform in general? Are you doing direct compression? Are you doing a granulation system? What is the type of technology that would make more sense? How much sensing and how much control do you really want to implement? And for what reason? Okay. Um, and it's not true that more sensing is always better. Because the, more, the, the larger number of data streams, the uh, potential for conflict grows exponentially. So you have to be prepared to do reconciliation of your different data streams as well. So it's very important to think carefully about what to measure and for what reason, and how much modeling. Now, the outcome of this would be to choose the right pathway to gain some experience from implementing that first system and to bring core capabilities into the company. I want to mention this also. The most important thing about getting into implementing a continuous manufacturing system is the learning opportunity to basically bring new core competences into the organization. And that's not to be trivialized, OK? I understand that this is a, an engineering-rich company, so maybe for you it wouldn't be as hard. But I can tell you right now, for some of the pharma companies we work with, is basically been a major transformation opportunity to really bring all of this engineering tool set into what they do, because they weren't doing it before. Okay? Then the next step, which is to characterize material properties. It's important to think, okay, which materials are you going to characterize? Which measurements are you going to use, and for what reason? And how will you use the information? Are you going to use it for modeling purposes? Are you going to use it just to set up proper ingredient specifications? You know, what are the, the methodologies you're going to use to process that data? I mean, there are many questions that are important at that point. How will the information be maintained? These are important questions that need to be addressed. But the outcome of this activity is a material property database that really describes your ingredients in a meaningful way, together with algorithms that allow you to predict how different materials will behave in your process. Okay? How long and how much effort? Well, in our experience, you should plan for two to three people working on this, and the Amount of time would depend on how many materials need to be involved and also how many measurements. Uh, it's usually a very intense effort in the first year until the systems are in place. Then it becomes easier because it's, it becomes a little bit more repetitive. So why do you do perform material characterization? I already mentioned some reasons, right? One is to understand batch to batch variability. Another is, for example, and it's co very common in pharma, when you want to replace one material with another. So the material property characterization allows you to determine which material will behave most like the one you already tested for a given application. Alternatively, if you have a material that you haven't used yet, but it's very similar to one you have used, typically you already know a fair amount about how that new material is going to behave. Um, there are other reasons, but before we go there, we do a lot of material property screening, but we came up with a list of things to measure after working with these processes for quite a, a while. So the logical approach we follow is presented in this picture. This is what we do. So we have our line. And for our line, we took the time to identify what are the most important failure modes. Where would our process fail? 
Our process will fail when the powders get stuck in the feeders, or when the powders agglomerate out of the feeders, or when the powders, for whatever reason, will not mix properly in the blenders, and there are a couple different mechanisms that could cause that, or perhaps when we have too much weight variability in the tablet press, or the tablets coming out of the tablet press don't have the right hardness or don't dissolve properly. So out of understanding the failure modes, we then ask the next question. Which material properties are relevant to my failure modes? And once we identify that, then we can talk about, OK, what are the alternative measurements to quantify this material attribute? How do they compare? How do they relate to each other? And there are a number of techniques that we use to answer those questions. But I want you to get this concept. We guide our selection of what to measure and how to measure it based on a prior acquired understanding of how the process fails, not the other way around. And the reason we don't do it the other way around is that people have tried and people have failed. Okay? I've been already several times in rooms with a lot of very smart material scientists and chemists and engineers, and you ask the question, what should we measure? And people make a list of 100 different things, which is both impossible and pretty close to useless. So we try to make our choices of what to measure based on what we know would be important in terms of the process. So electrostatics comes up in very quickly. Electrostatics is not terribly important in batch manufacturing, but in continuous it is, because when the powder begins to stick to things, it can, for example, stick to the discharge of your feeder, or it can clog the screws of your gravimetric feeder. And when this happens, first you lose capacity, and then you lose the ability to run the process. OK, so based on this kind of reasoning, we select techniques that go from wetting and drop penetration into a powder to compressibility to classic flow, powder flow characterization, cohesion to electrostatic measurements. I don't really have time to go into the details of the techniques. I think we have some time tomorrow to talk about this. So let me keep going here. Because collecting the database of measurements is only the first step. Then you have to figure out how to use the data. And we use it in lots of different ways. One of the things we do is we use principal component analysis and other data mining methods to try to reduce the dimensionality of the data set, meaning how many measurements do I really need? OK? You say, OK, I have to characterize powder flow. Well, there must be 50 different ways to do it. How many of those different ways do I need? And what do they tell me? So PCA is a very well-established method for identifying which measurements are orthogonal with respect to each other, meaning they contain different information versus which measurements are collinear. So they're basically telling me more or less the same thing. So then I can restate my material property information in terms of principal components out of which I can very quickly determine how many measurements do I actually need to describe the variability in the data set. And based on that, moving forward, I can then perhaps select a smaller number of measurements that contain the most relevant measurements so that I'm also getting rid of all the noise coming in from the measurements that are not actually important to the desired outcome. Okay? So it's important to do this. It's also important not to do it too soon, because it's also common that a new application might require different measurements. So you shouldn't rush to minimize the number of measurements, but it's important to do that. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. Um, I'm going to be sure I finish in time. So moving forward with this, then the next steps, three and four, are basically to characterize the performance of your different unit operations and to model them. Yeah? And so I want to say, for continuous powder processing, because we've been working on this for a long time, and because other groups have started working on this too, there is already quite a bit of work that has been done. There's already a lot of models for powder unit operations. One does not need to start from scratch. Okay? There are model libraries out there that can be accessed, and we're also happy to share what we've done. Yeah? But it's important <laughs> to understand how to use those models. So uh, it's important to be working together with people who have been doing this for a while. The outcome of this activity is to create a model library that captures the performance of your processes. Yes? And so the effort this typically takes is three to four people working for a year to two years to really create a good library of process models that captures your company's footprint. Okay? Um, and to have people on the company side that can basically take that input. So quickly on models, right? So here is two very common pieces of equipment, a gravimetric feeder and a continuous mixer. So there is a list of design parameters. These are the choices you make when you buy the equipment or when you decide how you're going to set it up to run it. Then operating variables. These are the, the knobs you can turn as you're 
running your process. So for example, for a mixer, you can change the speed at which the mixer is running. Um, you can change the amount of powder per unit time that you pump through your mixer. In some cases, the amount of powder residing in the mixer while you're operating it, right? And then these are the things you're trying to model. These are the responses. These are the things you're trying to predict. So for example, for a feeder, you want to predict flow rate. You want to predict the commingling of ingredients as they go through the feeder. You want to predict the resistance time in your feeder, the variability in flow rate, etc., and so on and so forth. So when we say the feeder model, that's misleading. We don't have a feeder model. We have a half a dozen models for the feeder that predict different aspects of what the feeder would do. And these models communicate to each other to different degrees. Okay? Now, I just want to give you a quick example of the kinds of models. So there is many different things that fit the description of a model. In here, I'm showing the variability in flow rate as a function of the RPM of the screw for 11 different materials. And this data, just simple as that, tell you that variability is minimized between 40% and 90% of nominal capacity. And you could say, OK, if I'm running between 40 and 90, I am getting the best performance this feeder can, do, can give me. And that's called a heuristic model, meaning it's a rule based on data telling you this is the right way to do it. That's the simplest kind of model. That's the same kind of model that your two-year-old would use to learn not to stick her fingers in the electrical outlet. That thing hurts. I shouldn't do it. She has a model in her head, right? That's a model. A model is a predicted relationship between an input and an output. Now, there are many other models, right? So for example, the next type of model, which is a phenomenological model, is described here showing the flow rate of powder as a function of the powder bulk density, yes, under constant conditions, using, in this case, four different screws. So somebody did a DOE, figured out that there is a proportionality, and figured out that you can adjust the proportionality relatively quickly, and now we can predict flow rate of the next powder based on the bulk density. I still don't know anything about how the powder gets into the feeder, but I'm beginning to predict the amount of powder coming out of the feeder. Now, we can go much further beyond that. So typically, the thinking goes like this. I am going to run a DOE. I'm going to vary some material parameters. I'm going to run vary some process parameters. I'm going to collect data. And out of that, I might build a polynomial representation. And I might select my condition, right? So that's the simplest type of statistically based model where we can, to some extent, predict process outputs within the range of experimental conditions explored. But you bring me a new material, and I have to start over. Or you ask me about a different RPM or something else. So that leads to process models. These are mechanistic process models. Maybe I took the time to write an equation that describes what's happening as the powder is being taken in. And that equation can predict other conditions, different than the ones I tested. It's still pretty laborious. still takes a lot of work. You still need to run new materials. And the best kind of models that we have been able to develop are material-based models, where basically what we do is the following. We did the mechanistic model for the process, and then we looked at the relationship between the model parameters and the material properties. And when we get to that point, you bring me half a kilo of powder in a jar, I test the powder, and then I predict the parameters of the process model. So I'm predicting how this new powder is going to run in my equipment before I put it through my equipment. That takes a day or two as opposed to a couple of months. So for example, for feeders, and just an example, we've done this for a lot of different systems, but we don't have time here, right? So just for a feeder, can we predict flow rate of a powder based on powder properties? So the Hickel model, most of you are probably familiar with it, predicts the relationship between powder density and compression pressure, yes? So we can say, OK, what if the powder in my feeder is compressing based on Hickel's model? And you know, I could assume that the pressure is proportional to the height of the powder in the, in the feeder, for example. So I can put that in my model. And then I can assume that the density of the powder in the screws is going to be proportional to the mass flow rate. And based on that, I can build a relatively simple model like this, based on the observed feed factor being 
a function of the maximum possible fee factor and the minimum possible fee factor, and this beta coefficient, which is essentially the compressibility of the powder in the hopper. And based on that, I can correlate those parameters to a few powders, and I can learn how to correlate these three things, for example, with the relevant powder properties. And then you bring me a new powder that I haven't tested, and I test it in the lab, and I extract the material properties, and I can predict the feed factor of saturation, and the minimum, and the beta, and here is a powder that we're predicting in terms of the instantaneous flow rate as the feeder goes through five refills, and as a function of time, as the powder level in the hopper decreases because I'm feeding powder up, and then increases again because I refill, you can see that we are pretty close to predicting the instantaneous screw speed required to maintain the flow rate, the nominal flow rate. So this is just one example. We have uh, spent 10 years building this model library, so we have many more models for many other process components. They don't need to be reinvented at this point, and here is a partial list of things that we have done for feeders, for hoppers, for mixers, granulators, dryers, roller compactors, tablet presses, etc. This keeps growing. Every new process brings us the opportunity to look at that slightly different feeder, a new kind of mixer, a new kind of granulator. Everything gets accumulated in two places. So our material property library serves as a reservoir of knowledge about materials. And our model library serves as a reservoir of process engineering knowledge. And we do it for everybody that we work with, but some of the companies are now doing it internally so that they basically see this toolbox that I described as a place where they can accumulate their process knowledge so that when they have to develop the next system, maybe they already have 70 or 80 percent of what they need. And so the second system takes less, and the third system takes even less, and so on and so forth. So after you've done this, the next two steps are to create and validate the open loop integrated flow sheet, yeah? Olive. So how do you do that? Well, there is already software commercially available that gives you a framework. And now you come with your unit operation models and you put them in boxes that already talk to each other. And that already had algorithms that allow you to simulate designs of experiments or simulate a controller or to run a methodology for optimization. So there are algorithm toolboxes attached to these models so that once you have the unit operation models, creating the integrated model is not very difficult. Um, so after you do that, you test the predictions of your integrated model by comparison to your actual physical system. Um, if we start from scratch, this takes one to two years. And that allows you to do dynamic simulations. So these simulations are resolved with respect to time. So for example, if we predict that there is this little hiccup, yeah, this small blue peak, in the amount of an ingredient coming in, because every time I refill the feeder, there will be this little bump, which would actually be a big bump, by the way. Um, one question would be, OK, if I have a bumpy signal from the feeders into the process, what would happen to the product? And so if you had developed models that, for example, are able to describe the resistance time distribution in the mill and the blender and so on, then the model can predict precisely that. So if this is the little bump coming into the blender, <coughs> this in red or orange shows how that bump gets now spread over by the mixer. And this is what's at the discharge of the mixer. And I could keep going downstream and I could predict, OK, in the finished product, how much variation this is going to cause. And you can predict other things, like is the density of the product going to be affected? Is the flowability of the powder going to be affected? Is the hardness of the tablets going to be affected? So how long does it take to make this prediction? Milliseconds. Once this is coded, it's very quick. So once you have these models in place, and the next step, which is to put in place the control architecture, you can then incorporate that into the physical line and use it for control purposes. Like, for example, you predict the product is going to be OK, no control action necessary. The product is not going to be OK. Maybe I need to divert some product to scrap, or maybe I can still take a corrective action so that the product would be OK after all. OK? So one other thing you can do with this 
open loop model is you can do sensitivity analysis. You can say, well, I can count maybe 22 different things that can affect my performance. And I can count maybe 20 meaningful outputs that I want to know about. How do I know which of these inputs are important to which of these outputs? Are you going to hire 20 interns and have them work in the line for seven or eight years? Or if you have an integrated model, you can actually run overnight a couple thousand simulations and then look at what is the relative impact of each of these variables on the desired output. Moreover, you can also look at what happens when two or three of these factors become active at the same time. And that allows you to determine which are your critical material attributes and your critical process parameters, affecting what later on you would decide are your critical quality attributes. Assuming we've done this, the next question, and actually I have to say, this is one logical stopping point. Some companies have stopped there. I said, OK, I'm going to get to this point. I'm going to define what are the critical variables. I'm going to implement sensors. I'm going to stop there, right? So uh, the next step is to put the right sensors in place. So think about the logic here. In the previous step, we determined what were the critical things to measure. So now is when we are in a position to say, OK, now I have to decide which things I'm going to measure and how. Because by now, I know which factors are important. So that's where you then get into selecting the right sensors. But it's not just about sensors. There are three types of information available to you in a continuous line. There is information from sensors that you put in place, yeah? physical sensors. Spectroscopic sensors, like a spectrometer, or non-spectroscopic sensors, like a thermocouple. That's one source of information. There is a second source of information, which is information you cannot measure, but you can predict using a model. That's called soft sensing, right? And so that's a second type of information that you can acquire. And there is a third kind of information, which is that a lot of the process parameters generate time series data streams that contain a lot of useful information. For example, your tablet presses keep track of the compression force pretty much for every tablet you compress. That information is very useful and very important. Yeah? So these three different kinds of information need to be brought together in a meaningful way. And that is a non-trivial effort. So selecting the right measurements, implementing the right measurements, validating the right measurements, and then incorporating those measurements into the model is an effort that typically takes about two people working for about a year. Now, many of these tasks are done in parallel, by the way, right? Otherwise, if you're counting years, we're all going to retire before you get anywhere. So um, here is a list of some of the sensors that we have used. So we have used ultrasound, near infrared and Raman spectroscopy, Raman imaging, uh, online particle size analysis, thermal imaging, X-ray measurements, etc. right? And this is just to remind you that these measurements are used in the physical line that we actually implemented. So typically, we develop our sensing systems in a second laboratory where we can really play with things. You don't want to be doing all of the development in the actual fully integrated, full scale line, because that basically would take too much time and would be complicated. So it's a good idea to have a second laboratory where you can work very flexibly to try different things and to quickly choose what are the right methods that work for you. We also use other methods to understand product. And this is definitely not an online measurement. This is a totally different technique where we use a 3D, a 3D scanning Raman microscope, where we take product units, and we grind them, and we acquire Raman images with 10 micron resolution so that we can then determine where the ingredients are in three dimensions. And the reason we do this is because Depending on the ingredients and the process, you create different structures. The different structures determine product performance. Understanding the relationship between ingredients, process, structure, and performance is really product design. So just to mention, there is a lot of actual uh, product science that comes into the picture as well. In terms of soft sensors, things you cannot measure, this is a pharma application. Okay, There might be analogs here, but I'll tell you about a pharma case. So, one of the critical quality attributes of a pharmaceutical tablet is the rate of dissolution. At what rate is the drug substance coming out of the tablet? Yeah? Some products, the drug is supposed to come out really quickly. Some products, is supposed to come out slowly over a period of 12 hours. So 
there is no physical measurement you could take to measure the dissolution profile in real time to use it for control purposes. Because if it takes an hour or longer to measure the profile, how are you going to use that for real time control? So instead, what we do is, well, we create different versions of the product that exhibit different dissolution profiles. That's what this data is. And we identify the mechanisms that control the dissolution rate. And we identify measurements, non-destructive measurements we can take quickly that would correlate to the dissolution profile. And so we create models based on things we can measure very quickly that predict how tablets dissolve. And here is the comparison for one tablet between the prediction and the measurement. We've done this now for several different formulations. So this critical quality attribute that I cannot measure in real time, I can model predict in real time based on other measurements, and now I can control it because I know what it depends on. And I can incorporate that into my system. Okay? So what does it look like at the end of the day? So here is a schematic of the line. And so for example, we take spectroscopic information near infrared and Raman to monitor the composition of the blend. We take measurements from the tablet press in terms of, for example, the position of the punches and the compression force to very quickly determine what is the weight of the tablets and what's the density of the tablets coming out. We use a laser method to measure the thickness of the tablet in real time. We use ultrasound to very quickly predict what the tablet hardness is going to be without having to crush the tablet. And we use, again, your infrared spectroscopy to measure the composition of the tablet. And then many of these measurements are fed back for control purposes. Okay? And this is a schematic of information flow in the line that allows us to control the critical quality attributes in real time. Right? Once you got to this point, now you're ready to design your control system. And this is not to be underestimated. Okay? So basically, for even a simple, simple system like this, there are three or four different major control architectures. Within each control architecture, the controllers can accept different control laws. And each of those control laws has multiple parameters that need to be optimized. So you're looking at a couple hundred different versions of a control system. Now, I'm old enough to have done this by hand. I used to implement control systems when they were nomadic controllers, right? And I don't need to tell you how much work that is. That's not how we do it anymore. The way we do it is we model the controllers in the flow sheet. And we ask the model to tell us which control architecture, with which kind of control law, and which defined actuators, and which controller gains and integration times give us which results. That's how we find the right controller architecture and settings that maximize stability, give us the optimum response time, minimize the, the time we spend out of spec, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So those are what these steps are. You define your control architecture. You then train your control architecture. And then you code your control architecture into the model so that now you have a model of the closed loop system. This has to then be compared to, again, experiments, right? Now you have your model with the controllers. You have your line with the controllers. You operate your line. You test the response of your line with the controllers by purposefully perturbing your line. You kick your line, and you see what happens and what the controllers are doing. And you compare that with what the model is predicting until the model is accurate. And then you go to the last step. And I'm going to skip some of the pretty pictures, which is to optimize. So now I have a model of the line that is experimentally verified, that is able to simulate not only what the powders are doing in the process. This model is also able to simulate what happens when I take data from one point I feed that data to a process controller, and then I go and I actuate some other point in my line to modify performance, either feedback or feed forward. Now that I have that model, I can ask a different question. What's the best? What is the set of conditions? And you can actually do this even for some changes in design conditions. What is the set of conditions that gives me the best product quality, the best productivity, the minimum amount of waste, where I make the most money. And there are techniques and there are methods. There are many methods to do this, right? So typically, there are three different things you have to think about. You have to choose your goal. 
what are you trying to optimize? Then you have to figure out which levers can you pull. And then you have to figure out what are the boundaries of what you can do. Okay? Now, it goes into math. A quarter to three after a heavy lunch. I'm not going to walk you through the math. So instead of that, the logic is relatively simple, right? So you have your model, and you have your optimization algorithms, and you iterate until you reach the predicted best, and then you go and you try it in the lab. Are you getting what the model says you're getting? OK? All right, so if you've been keeping track, if you were doing this for the very first time with very little help, this is a realistic workflow. Yeah? Six months to create the right plan, about 24 months from there to have a well-characterized process and well-characterized materials, another 12 months to integrate the line, put the sensors in place. Then in another six months, you have closed loop control, and in another six months, you could optimize. The very first time you do it, and with very little help, this is a realistic time span of this process. And like a previous speaker said, maybe you can cut it back to three years if you double the number of people. But don't think you can do it in six months by putting 50 people to work on this. Because there is an internal growth process. You have to acquire all these disciplines. You have to institutionalize them. You have to socialize them. You have to get people talking differently to each other. Yeah. You can do it faster with help. It will be much faster the second time. It will be even faster the third time, because you are building on established knowledge. You are adding to the databases. You are expanding the existing model library. You already have experience. You have people with the right knowledge in place. But as a starting point, it is a three to four year process to get to a fully implemented advanced manufacturing system. So my last slide, I take you all the way back to the very beginning. Yeah. That's the toolbox. And now look at the vertical lines, not as pharma, catalyst, etc., but look at them as product one, product two, product three, product four. Yeah? Your basic disciplines remain the same. You just apply them to slightly different products. So if all you did was create a proper material property database and a process library, that's one work package. That work package, moving forward, allows you to predict how your materials will perform. So that work package by itself allows you to say a lot of things about how the next material is going to work and how the material after that is going to work. Or using this information backwards, it also allows you to make decisions about what properties do you need your ingredients to have. Now, maybe it's different in this company, but in most of the companies I've interacted with, the whole exercise of choosing ingredient specifications is um, less than optimal. Let me put it that way. Yeah? And the conversation with the ingredient supplier is never very satisfactory, right? On the company side, the complaint is, you never give me the powders I want. On the supplier side, is you never really tell me what you need. Well, this actually changes that, because now you can actually go back and say, I need a cohesion in this range. I need a density in this range. I need you know, a porosity in this range. Or the powder is not going to work for my feeders. OK? All right. Then we add the next big chunk of stuff, the other two, yeah? the, the, uh, the third and the fourth pieces of the toolbox. Right? Now we know about sensors, and we know about process control. And if that is your implementation package, that allows you to do predictive process design. You're at the point now where you can create flow sheets, where you can create control systems, and where you can govern your process and achieve real-time quality assurance. If you then put in place the last component of the toolbox, now you can optimize. So you can optimize your process performance. You can optimize your product quality. You can maybe make as much money as possible. Now, about a few months ago, we launched a website, which I assume that you're going to get copies of the slides. If you go there, everything I told you and a lot more is explained in detail. There is also a library of publications there that you can find. There are quite a few presentations that we have collected from other places. So if you want to have a chance to 
to see more detail, you can go there, or if not, you can give us a call and we'll be happy to talk some more. Thank you very much.